I'll answer one question and give one introductory remark before the talk. Um, I actually am a half physicist, half biologist by your definition. I'm going to conclude that the uh, random mutations play a very important role, but in a programmed system. <laughs> so the, 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 there's only a subset of uh, uh, cells in the body that really are going to be players for those random mutations which give rise to a longevity problem. Um, and so I'm, I'm half, that, that's probably exactly where I am at the Institute for Advanced Study because they, I live with the physicists there. Um, secondly, let me say that uh, I find it uh, amusing. Uh, in, in the 1960s, I was a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, and right across the street was Leonard Hayflick and, uh, at the Wistar Institute, and, and uh, he taught some courses that I took, and I was enormously influenced by his uh, ideas. And so I could proudly say it took me 55 years to come up with a different idea. And, and so having him speak after me would be, <laughs> would be a, a good way to finally say I've managed to break it, maybe I've managed to break into a new uh, uh, paradigm, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I'm gonna do, I wanna just break up my talk into four parts. Um, the, the first was, is just to introduce you to a protein and gene called P53, which plays a major role in cancer, as you'll see. And it uh, probably, if I was to define it functionally the way I define it now, it's a stress responder. Uh, it's quite remarkable in that it responds to many diverse kinds of stresses um, of all types, <laughs> um, and metabolic, and uh, DNA damage, and uh, hypoxia, the telomere erosion, a whole variety of uh, stresses. So it's a central player in the stress responding uh, over a, a lifetime. Uh, at, at, at first, uh, but it also uh, plays an interesting role in the second topic I'm going to talk about, and that is stem cell biology. So uh, this turns out to be historically a player in stem cell biology, and I'll talk about why it's historically a player, historically being evolutionarily. It, it arose actually in evolutionary sense, uh, watching over the germline. And it ensures fidelity uh, in watching over the germline its function is to ensure fidelity by death. So it is a grim reaper for fidelity. And in that sense, it's very, uh, it's the counterbalance to random mutation. Because when it sees pretty bad mutations, uh, it responds by killing off the cell that has those kinds of, of mutations in it. Uh, so then the third thing I'll talk about, I'll talk about P53, I'll talk about stem cells. I need to define stem cells for you because it's, I think longevity is about a particular subset of stem cells, which I'll come to call tissue-specific stem cells. And, that's, and I think cancer is about that, too. And then I want to talk about the role of P53 in stem cells. So that's an important player in uh, the surveillance of stem cells, again, ensuring fidelity by death. Right? Um, and then, I'll, uh, as a consequence of sort of developing that theme, I want to come back and finish with a model for uh, aging and longevity, which has to do with mutations in stem cells that change their properties dramatically. And I'll present evidence, there's good experimental evidence that such things occur. There's probably little experimental evidence that they are the cause of shortening longevity, but um, they certainly don't give a pleasant life um, when these things happen. So let me start with P53. And this is a protein that um, it may be in some sense unfortunate that it was discovered in the context of cancer because it plays a much broader role than cancer. But having been discovered in the context of cancer, it also plays a very central role in cancer. So let me uh, say, if I can, yeah. Uh, this, this is just a skyscraper plot, plot of hi uh, historical data. It's about a year old now, a year out of date, I should say. Um, and uh, this comes from the sequ DNA sequencing experiments of people who are sequencing a wide variety of cancers. There's 36 different kinds of tumors here. Uh, you, not all of them named, but the 36 uh, lines here of, of tumors. Uh, and then uh, these tumors have been sequenced. They're something like 300 to 500 tumors sequenced. <clears throat> and there are 125 of the most commonly mutated genes in those cancers. Um, th this means that they've re been repetitively found. That's one line of evidence there important. 
But in every case, 125 of these genes have, all of them have been tested in mice and they give rise to cancer. Um, they, they may not be sufficient for cancer, but they can be necessary for the pathway of, of cancers. So that they're validated in mice for being uh, important mutated cancer genes. And then actually the, uh, <laughs> the uh, ordinate you can't uh, see is the frequency. So it goes from zero down here all the way up to 60% or so 100% being up, up on top. So um, <clears throat> this is skyscraper plot tells you that uh, there are a lot of genes that are contributing to cancers. Um, they fall into, I'm just gonna go quickly, they fall into roughly three categories. Uh, there are small players, one to five percenters. You can see these guys, the one to five percenters. Uh, they may be small players in many cancers, they may be small players in one cancer and a large player in another. BRAF is a good example of 50% of melanomas, but only 7% of colon cancers, for example, right? So that's, those, are, those are one category. Uh, second category is a thir I'll call 30 percenters. Uh, these are guys that are very popular. Um, uh, RAF, uh, BRAF, well, BRAF is drug now, but RAS is a good example. MYC is another good example. Uh, BCL2 is another good example. Um, NF-kappa B is a good example of, of uh, deregulated uh, transcription factor in cancer at the, about the 30% level over all cancers, 36 different cancer types. And quite amazingly, the pharmaceutical industry has done a great job of targeting the 5 percenters and has not targeted at all any of the, and any of the PI3 kinase is a good example of one guy's here. Uh, not targeted any, any of them except the gamma delta PI3 kinase and lymphocytes is the only drug available at this time. And then there's a really quite outstanding player here where you can see the skyscraper goes across many different tumors and that's P53. It's about 55 to 60 percent of all tumors have mutations and probably 90 percent of all tumors have inactivated P53 in one way or another, mutation being not the only way to inactivate the protein. So this is a pretty, this says, uh, it justifies why you want to work on it and it says this is a pretty central player when things go wrong with the homeostasis that is cell division and death and the equilibrium of cells in, in, a, in a body uh, gets out of the, that kind of equilibrium. Okay, so that's, uh, that got, oh, uh, okay, fine. So now you could add, so this is called, by the way, there are mutations in both alleles. So that means that the uh, heterozygote has not got cancer and does have a phenotype actually, but has not got cancer and the heterozygote uh, is the wild type's dominant over the uh, mutation. And, and indeed, all the evidence is that the mutation is mainly a loss of function uh, mutation. So both alleles are mutated in most great majority of cancers. So you could ask the question, how the heck the tumor suppresses a rise in an evolutionary sense uh, in humans? They're surveilling somatic cells over a lifetime. And I heard at breakfast, for instance, the nice hypothesis that everybody knows, that says, hey, evolution takes you up to your reproductive years and afterwards you're on your own. And uh, here's a guy who uh, in post-reproductive years is a tumor suppressor protecting you against the uh, uh, cancers. So it would violate that uh, in, in some strange way, unless it has other functions, which I think it does, in fact. Um, however, the reason this arose actually was in the germline. So in, uh, th this is just a little, in invertebrates, for example, in, in sea anemones, in flies, and in worms, the three places it's been studied, um, P53 homolog, the, 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 the gene closest to P53 in those three, three species or three phyla, um, it is in fact in the germline. And it's in the germline only, uh, except sometimes it's in the immune system cells. But it's in the germline, and what it does is protect against DNA damage in the germline. It protect, even in the worm, it protects against starvation. So if you starve a worm, the eggs will undergo apoptosis. And the reason they undergo apoptosis is they do so in a P53 dependent fashion, realizing that you do not want to lay eggs in a barren environment, right? And, and that's, again, an evolutionarily very clever way for this to arise. It is surveilling fidelity by, in fact, because you make mistakes when you starve and you make mistakes when, when the damp DNA is damaged and the mutation rates go way up. So it is ins ensuring fidelity by death in, in invertebrates. Uh, somewhere in the vertebrates, uh, P53 moves from the germline 
where it no longer plays a protective role. One of its sister genes, P63, continues to protect the female germline. So an anorexic woman who's starving for glucose will undergo apoptosis in her, uh, her um, eggs and uh, no longer makes estrogen and will stop menses, for example. And all these things are due to a P63 surveillance, just like the worm, surveillance of starvation and you don't want to lay eggs when you're starving. You don't want to ovulate and, and fertilize when you're starving. So um, the, some of the functions have continued, but P53 moves into the somatic tissues. And in the somatic tissues, it repurposes for protecting against cancer. Okay? And that's really the, what uh, this slide says. There's a P53, 63, 73. There are three sisters in humans, and they have different functions. Oddly enough, P63 is a major transcription fa factor for skin regeneration. It's in the skin stem cell in the, the hair follicle. Uh, this just tells you a little bit about how the system works. Uh, this, a whole variety of stresses are listed up on top. And uh, these stresses that are listed up on top um, uh, all work through the negative regulator of P53, a ubiquitin ligase called MDM2. So stress activates the negative regulator, uh, the, it, sorry, inactivates the negative le regulator. P53 levels rise because everything is done by the half-life of the protein, not by transcription. Uh, that's a very good strategy if you want to respond rapidly because that means that the half-life of the P53 protein is six to 20 minutes in a cell. So by 12 minutes, you've doubled the concentration. There are also protein modifications of P53, which activated as a transcription factor. And then it rolls in a program of transcription depending upon the cell type it's in and depending upon whether it's a tumor cell or a normal cell. And the programs it rolls in are uh, many kinds of programs. It actually corrects metabolic abnormalities in one program. In another program, it causes apoptosis. In another, senescence, so terminal differentiation. In another cell cycle arrest, allowing repair of DNA, for example, and then go back into cell cycle. So it has a number of transcriptional programs for a variety of cell types. And in fact, in, uh, since chemotherapy is DNA damaging therapy, uh, the, the loss of bone marrow, the loss of your hair, uh, all due to P53 mediated apoptosis. You lose your hair follicles you, uh, because of P53 mediated apoptosis and you lose your hair. So if you could block that, if you could block P53, you could keep your hair. And you could keep your bone marrow to, to boot if you could block it. So um, th th this is the way the, the protein works. So now let me introduce you. I've told you about the protein. Let me introduce you to the cells. And uh, there are indeed uh, many kinds of stem cells, <laughs> right? Uh, there is, of course, the, the totipotent stem cell, which is a fertilized egg. It makes all extra embryo in the mammals. It makes all extra embryonic membranes, and it will also make all of the components of the, of the cell. Uh, I think I may even have a slide on this. Yeah, it makes all the components of the cell. So there's a, um, the fertilized egg up, up on top. And then it, it, in uh, what is a remarkably preserved developmental stage, uh, it makes a blastula, just as it does in almost every organism, uh, invertebrate or vertebrate. And the blastula is a, uh, usually a hollow sphere with a few cells in the upper, in the dorsal quadrant. And these are called the inner mass cells. And each inner mass cell is a pluripotent stem cell. Uh, you could take a single inner mass cell that's marked genetically. And what you could do with it is to inject it into another blastocyst. And it will contribute to every, every tissue of the body uh, genetically. And so that tells you that it's really pluripotent. What it doesn't make, it makes germline, it makes all tissue cells, but what it doesn't make is it doesn't make extra embryonic membranes. So it is not totipotent, but pluripotent. Uh, inner mass cells are equivalent to what are called induced pluripotent stem cells, which is a Yamanaka experiment for which he got the Nobel Prize, where he takes four transcription factors, puts it in the fibroblasts, and it reprograms the fibroblast by moving back in developmental time, making an inner mass cell which could be put back into a mouse and contribute to many tissue types. His major problem is, in fact, that two of the transcription factors are oncogenes, and so the mice develop tumors and you never get full developmental uh, properties. Uh, what's quite interesting is the Yamanaka, uh, and here's the first role of, of showing P53 playing a role in the reprogramming of, of cells. Um, in the Yamanaka experiment, the, the efficiency is terrible. 
So if you, if you transfect 100 fibroblasts or 1,000 fibroblasts, only one of them, 0.1%, will actually be reprogrammed into an induced pluripotent stem cell. And in the mouse, that takes three weeks to do it. In the human, it takes six weeks to, to uh, three, three months, as long as three months. And the efficiency is even lower in the human, right? So the Yamanaka experiment works in a very inefficient way. If you do it in the absence of P53, the efficiency goes up to 80% and the timeline goes down to six days, <laughs> right? That tells you P53 is surveilling epigenetic changes that are occurring as you reprogram, and it's surveillance by death again, right? So P53 is blocking the efficiency of changing epigenetic changes and, and the programming of stem cells. In fact, if you, and this has become a pattern you'll see again and again, in fact, if you uh, take a temperature-sensitive mutant of P53, and you allow reprogramming to a stem cell, so you get into mast cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, and now you shift to the permissive temperature, so you turn P53 on, it forces the stem cell into differentiation and death. All right? So it, when it's activated by to be a transcription factor, it is surveilling stem cells and not allowing them to perpetuate themselves. And as you'll see in a few minutes, in all stem cells, the P53 activity is therefore off so that the cells <laughs> replicate rapidly, okay? All right, um, uh, th I'll get back to what the different tissue types mean and why they're related to P53 in another slide. So uh, let me introduce you to the third kind of stem cell, which is the player that I'm gonna talk about. It's, I'll call it a tissue-specific stem cell. Um, we had probably the very first tissue-specific stem cell ever isolated, and the one we know most about uh, is the hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, that's in your bone marrow. It, it actually starts off uh, in the yolk sac and makes all the blood components. It moves to the fetal liver in development and then moves to the bone marrow. And over your lifetime, it perpetuates 30 different cell types and many tissue types. So oligodendroglia in the brain and Kupfer cells in the liver and all of the blood cells you make are, come from that single stem cell. And it was isolated a long time ago and shown to be have many, many pathways, right? Uh, but now we actually know how to grow it. I'll just call that a CD34 positive cell. That's one of the markers for the stem cell. Uh, and it, we know a lot about its properties because we know, know it for a long time. And we didn't know much about any other stem cells, even though people kept jumping up and saying they had a stem cell. There, was, there wasn't a lot of evidence that it was a true, these were true tissue specific stem cells until a guy named Hans Klevers in, in Utrecht in the Netherlands uh, found a way to culture stem cells, uh, tissue-specific stem cells in vitro. And he started with the colon. So let me just tell you a little bit about colon stem cells and what their properties are. So uh, it turns out the colon turns over every four days so that you have villa in the colon. And in the crypts of the villa, right, in the little crypts is a single cell uh, or two cells called a slim cell. Uh, they're missed uh, photographically. You see them in the electron microscope. Very, not very easily you see them uh, in, in the light microscope because they're very thin cells. And they're hiding around other cells which had been apparently called stem cells. And uh, these stim slim cells uh, are regulated by the wind pathway. Right? So let, I'll tell you about the wind pathway. You can actually take them out of normal tissue. A human you can do or you can do a normal human colon or normal mouse colon. You take out the slim cells, you put them in matrigel. Now, it's very important to put them in a gel in suspension. It has uh, fibronectin, it has collagen, it has a number of other uh, attributes. And it's very important never to use serum. As soon as you use serum, the stem cells die, <laughs> right? So that means that everybody who's reported in the literature using 2% fetal calf serum or 10% fetal calf serum has killed off the stem cells <laughs> of, of many, many tissues. And it was working with what I'll call progenitor cells, which are downstream from stem cells. They're still pluripotent. They make a few tissue types, but they're not the real stem cell of the tissue. So you can't use serum. So then the next thing to do uh, is to figure out how these stem cells grow. So they require the hormone Wnt. So there are 12 or 14 Wnts. These are uh, extracellular proteins, secreted proteins. They're pretty insoluble. They live, love the matrigel. They attach to the matrigel pretty insoluble proteins, and they have receptors called frizzle. There's about 12 res frizzle receptors, and all combinations of wince and frizzles give you lots of combinatorics to, to work with. 
So um, here again is very nice. There's uh, the, the wind, pat. here's wind, here's frizzle, the, the receptor. Uh, and uh, when, when wind and frizzle engage, they start a signal transduction pathway. And I won't go through it, but the, the net result of that signal transduction pathway is the increase of a transcription factor called beta catenin. Now, the catenins are really interesting because they actually are present as a transcription factor, so they go in the nucleus and transcribe. They're also present at the cell surface where they make adhesion molecules. So they regulate adhesion between cells as well as regulating the, the, the cell cycle, the division of, of the cells. And that's important because if you think of an epithelial layer, you have to break adhesions to put a new cell into the, into the layer, right? Into the sphere or into the flat part of the layer. So the WINT is a real central pathway for all stem cells, as you'll see. Um, beta catenin levels rise. They go to the nucleus where they work on a, with a second uh, transcription factor called T cell factor, TCF4. Uh, and between them, they give rise to changes in gene expression. And uh, one of the first genes transcribed is cyclin D. And cyclin D is working with CDK4 and 6 and throws the cell into cycle. Right? So the first thing these stem cells do is divide like hell. They divide symmetrically, that's important. There's a whole literature about asymmetric divisions of stem cells, and these cells do not. The tissue-specific stem cells have never been seen to divide asymmetrically. So they divide symmetrically, they build up a population, and then they stop division. Something stops division, you'll see it's P53 in a minute, and that triggers differentiation. And then you leave the pool of stem cells there that have, that have stopped again for dividing, right? Now, there's a, uh, uh, this is done normally at very low levels. And there's a second hormone called R-spondin, right, which has a, a particular uh, receptor called LGR5. Actually, the, they all come in multiple genes. So there's, there's R-spondin uh, 1, 2, and 3. There's LGR4, 5, and 6, right, all of which are markers for stem cells. They are the best markers for stem cells we have, LGR5 in particular. Uh, and when that happens, uh, the wind pathway ratchets up 10 to 100 fold. And when that happens, stem cells divide like hell. Right? P53 stops them, and they go into cycle, and they become progenitor cells. Now, all of this happens in tissue culture. And in tissue culture, a normal colon stem cell will make a colon. It's called an organoid. And it looks like a colon. You section it, and it looks like a colon. It has, it has the, these, these uh, areas. And if you took a polyp from a person that had a particular mutation on the way to cancer, APC, it would make a polyp, not a colon. And if you took a cancer from a patient, it would make a cancerous organization, would be cancerous, right? Not, not normal colon. So it completely reproduces what you see in vivo in vitro. It's a great place to test drugs. It's a great place to actually ask the question, what drugs will work on the patient? All of these pathways are being taken now in, in positive ways. But most important, there are such things as tissue-specific stem cells. You can reproduce them in vitro and in vivo, right? And you know the players, right? You know the signal transduction pathway. There's feedback loops, so part of the wind pathway are two negative regulators, ubiquitin ligase. They block frizzled, they stop the pathway, right? And so ultimately, stem cells don't outrun the whole population. They're self-limiting in the pathway, right? So there's a homeostatic mechanism that watches over them. Mutations in the ubiquitin ligase cause cancer, right? The stem cells run wild, right? Arspondin amplifications cause cancer. They run wild. So it's all very explicable once you understand the, the, this the pathway. Now, this isn't an idle thing for colon, right? The skin turns over every 24 to 28 days. The stem cell for skin lives in the hair follicle. The stem cell for liver lives in the bile duct. Uh, the stem cell for a breast lives in the duct, right? It's, it's hidden in the, in the duct. Uh, there are stem cells, for, no, stem cells for prostate. There are stem cells for pancreas, right? Uh, in, in, and these stem cells can be taken out of normal tissue or cancerous tissue and grown in exactly the same way. They're all LGR5 positive. They all rely on wind. It's the definition of tissue-specific stem cells is the signal transduction pathway which regulates them. And there are about seven or eight of these pathways now that we know about. Okay? All right. So that's a tissue-specific stem cell, and we really can, can handle them, right? We really know how to get, get them out. 
All right, now, um, let me tell you a little bit about the role of P53 in regulating stem cells. I'm gonna start in invertebrates. Um, what have I got, 10 more minutes or 20 more minutes, 15 minutes? Uh, it's 9.30. I know it's 9.30, but what have I got left? I, that's right. <laughs> I can tell time, actually. Half, I have a half an hour, oh, wonderful. You can even slow down. <laughs> Um, so uh, let me tell you about invertebrates first. So uh, in planaria, that's flatworms, right? Not round worms, not, not the, the worm that Sidney Brenner started, you know, Rhabditis, but planaria, right? Uh, these are remarkable little worms that regenerate themselves. In fact, uh, we have a problem with flatworms. I'm sure they have a sexual cycle, but no one's been able to get them to mate in, in the lab. And so the way you get them to reproduce in the lab is you take a scissors, you cut them up in little pieces, and every part regenerates a whole planaria. Uh, in the best of experiments, you cut them in half, right? And the tail regenerates a head, because they have head and tail. And the head regenerates a tail. So they actually have uh, sensors that tell them whether you're a head piece or you're a tail piece, right? So people have looked real hard at, at you can do a little bit of genetics with planaria. Planaria eat bacteria. Uh, you can do a knockout of a gene or a knockout of a gene function by having a double-stranded RNA in the bacteria. They eat the bacteria, the double-stranded RNA survives the digestion period, it goes into cells, and now it makes an siRNA that blocks that gene. So you can block some genes and really figure out, try to figure out what's happening. So what happens is, uh, the first thing that happens is there's a blastema, uh, a cell type that forms at the cut. So if you cut planaria in half, you could watch new cells either migrate into the area or be reprogrammed. Uh, as you study this, you, become, you come to understand that Yamanaka's experiment is actually occurring in the planaria. It is reprogramming itself from a differentiated cell into an induced pluripotent stem cell, right? So the Yamanaka experiment, which is changing the epigenetics of the cell, has made it back into a stem cell. And that's the, the first step that you see. And you can see, if you isolate the, the blastocyst, blastocysts that are in, in these uh, planaria, you can actually see that the epigenetic program has changed transcriptionally and that the modifications of chromatin have changed and, and so forth. So that's really good. And then the next thing you see is P53 rises in this cell. Now that's the planaria P53, it's the homologue or P53. It rises and it no more, blastocyl, <laughs> no more blastocyl cells divide, and they differentiate. And they differentiate into the part of the planaria that's not there, right? So that's a big player. You block P53, and you never get differentiation <laughs> in, this, in this animal. And furthermore, if you block P53 function, right, right the, the blastocyl keeps growing, but you have immature cells. I don't know if that calls a cancer, or, or what do you want to call it, but that's exactly what, what you sort of get. And that may be the homologue of what thinking about cancer in, in humans could be about as well. So uh, that's planaria, it's pretty interesting. Now we'll go to a little closer to vertebrates. So fish, invertebrates, closer to vertebrates, in, in the vertebrate phyla, or whatever it's, yeah. Uh, it, fish and amphibia that, that are known to regenerate. So just like planaria regenerate, fish and amphibia regenerate. So the, one of the better studied things is to, uh, this is, this is hard for physicists, but biologists seem to like to do this. They cut the leg off of, an, of a salamander, right? So they cut the leg off for, of the salamander and it regenerates a leg. Or they cut the tail off a fish and it regenerates a tail, right? So fish actually, and, and that's pretty interesting, the amphibia and the, and the uh, bony fish actually uh, have regeneration possibilities that we don't have, right? Uh, somewhere along the line we've, we've lost it, right? Uh, so what happens is almost identical. In fact, it is identical to what you saw in planaria. What happens is some cell, except for the names, because everyone names things differently, a neoblast arises at the site of the cut, right, for the tail of the fish or the, the arm of the, of the planaria. The neoblast arises. It's a reprogrammed induced pluripotent stem cell. It is, in fact, a cell that grows up at very rapid pace, and then P53 rises, and bang, you make it, the rest of the leg differentiates out and all the tissues of the leg or all the tissues of the tail are made. And it's actually a fairly rep representative, so if you do a young fish or an old fish, therefore the sizes are different, it remembers the sizes of the fish. 
really is quite an interesting thing about how this is playing, how the regeneration is playing off of scale in terms of size and a whole bunch of questions that people haven't really explored and leaves this open as a really sort of interesting area. Right. Okay, so uh, what on earth is happening in these stem cells, the tissue-specific stem cells uh, with P53, right? Well, uh, it turns out we have actually an experiment of nature I'll talk about first since I have a little time. Uh, that's called a teratocarcinoma, right? So the teratocarcinomas are tumors of germlines. So they're tumors of precursors of sperm and tumors of precursors of eggs, right? So during, uh, they're, they're actually in the case of sperm, they're diploid, so that they, the tumors are diploid. In the case of eggs, they're actually parthenogenic events and they actually start off being haploid, right? So they're really quite interesting. Now, uh, teratocarcinomas are uh, tumors of the young, young males, 20 to 30 years old. Uh, teratomas are benign tumors. Teratocarcinomas are malignant tumors. What's a benign tumor? Benign tumor is a tumor that's fully differentiated from the stem cell of the tumor. So this tumor is composed of two cell types. A true stem cell, which if you take out, a single cell will make a whole tumor for you. And the tumor could have 20 different tissues in it. Because the stem cell differentiates spontaneously, and in differentiating spontaneously, you get benign cells. So this cancer is truly epigenetic, right? It must have a genetic component because actually in human females, that it's often inherited in families that women have teratomas. These teratomas are often picked up by an x-ray that shows teeth, nails, and, and, and bones in the ovary, right? Why? Because the teratoma is well differentiated, right? It's taken out and they become more fertile again, the females, right? Teratocarcinomas tend to occur in males, that is the malignant form in males, uh, but they can spontaneously differentiate, even if they're malignant, right? Okay, now, the state of P53 in that stem cell has been examined, right? It's wild type. It's, so I told, showed you in the first slide that all of these cells have inactivated P53, all of these cells have gotten rid of it by mutation, it is a 98% wild type in the stem cells of teratocarcinomas. It's as if it's not there, right? And it is not there. The protein is there, but it's not functional. If you look at all the genes that they transcribe, that P53 transcribes, they're dead in the water, right? However, it responds to DNA damage, chemotherapy. And the standard treatment for teratocarcinomas is cisplatinum, DNA damaging agent, P53 activates and kills the tumor. So 98% of teratocarcinomas are curable, right? A bike rider, right? A bike rider who used to take lots of hormones, right? <laughs> he, had, he had a teratocarcinoma. And he, and he had actually even brain meds, right? And it was cured because cisplatinum is such a good drug. So the reason why it hasn't got P53 mutations is it's silent. There's no way, reason to select against it. It's not there, literally, even though the protein is there, right? You put a protein modification on it, and the silent goes away, and the activation happens, and it kills the cell, right? Fidelity by, by death, right? Now, that's exactly what happens in these cells. As I told you, you take an induced pluripotent stem cell, or if I take a, a stem cell from the colon, from the skin, from the pancreas, doesn't matter, right? Uh, those stem cells, if they have wild type P53, it's inactive. If I activate it in any way, I have all these stresses to activate it, it kills the stem cell. It often kills by forcing a differentiated pathway, so it's like senescence. It's a terminal pathway, and that's why the, you turn over your colon every four days, the cells are dying and they're sloughing off by senescence, right? Okay, so uh, what P53 does it from invertebrates all the way through us, right? Right, is it's inactive in stem cells, largely, right? Allowing the stem cells to replicate. But the minute it activates, it forces the differentiation pathway, <laughs> right? Now, I can tell you that for sure that there are other pathways to differentiation beside P53. Uh, I can start with a mouse that has no P53. I can isolate a stem cell. It will replicate as stem cells. It will make lots of stem cells but it also can differentiate. It makes a mouse, right? 
So there are other pathways. So I want to leave you with the idea that P53 is one of several probabilistic activators for differentiation commitment. It's not the only one, but it's one of it. And I'll actually give you an example of another one for a particular lineage, the, the, the lymphoid lineage, uh, well, the myeloid lineage in, in, in a few minutes, okay? All right, so now you understand the role of P53 in stem cells. It is actually allowing, it's turning itself off to allow the stem cells to grow. That's why the Yamanaka experiment works, 80% Efficiency is because you are being able to create stem cells and they stay stem cells. They're preferentially staying stem, stem cells. So the Yamanaka experiment without P53 works. Right. Okay. Now I'm going to, now I want to just go sailing into the last part, which is to put all this together into a hypothesis about um, why we run downhill, why we wear out, right? <laughs> As the, the title of the Creston's. <laughs> Crossfit's uh, uh, meeting goes. Um, if I isolate, so I, uh, well, I'm gonna start with an experiment that was a surprise, right? So the hematopoietic stem cell, the CD34 bone marrow cell that makes all our blood, right? Um, is with us from, from fetal life all the way through to the end of our life. That stem cell exists, it keeps making blood. Uh, we make blood on various components of blood have very short half-life. Some Platelets have four-day half-lives. Red blood cells have 20-day half-lives. So we constantly have to regenerate this and we constantly rely on our stem cells. So we might think, just if we asked for a test of this, that if we took, a, let's say, a 10-year-old male or female, and we took a 80-year-old male or female, and we counted the number of stem cells that they had in the 10-year-old and the 80-year-old, that this would sort of run downhill with time and that we'd run out of stem cells and that would be one hypothesis for aging. But we could do the experiment because we can actually mobilize stem cells from the bone marrow, we have tricks to do that, take it out of the blood and do a count, right? And it turns out that for CD34 stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, the 80-year-old, the 70-year-old has more by a lot than the 10-year-old, more. Stem cells have increased over our lifespan, not decreased over our lifespan, right? Now, uh, I don't want to leave you with the impression that those stem cells are the same stem cells as they were at the beginning, right? For example, uh, there's an experiment we do all the time in medicine. It's a bone marrow transplant. We take the stem cell from the bone marrow of the donor and we put it into a recipient. We irradiate the recipient, we get rid of their stem cells, we replace the stem cells, and now you've got a whole new set of stem cells and, and progeny cells that come from the donor, right? Uh, your ability to be a donor starts to fade at the age of 40, and by 45 or 50, they'll never accept you as a donor again. In other words, you can't, the something happens to the stem cell over your lifetime so that you could be a donor. That donor is the best test for all lineages of the, of, of the stem cell to the progeny cells, right? So you can't be a donor over the age of 40, 45, right? Why? Yes, that's the question, why? That's, that's a good question, right? And I'm gonna show you that if you start looking at those hematopoietic stem cells at various ages, they have accumulated mutations, right? So a, a 70 or 80 year old male, right, who is relying on their stem cells to make myeloid tissue, myeloid tissue are monocytes and neutrophils, it's part of your immune system that's really pretty central and important. Uh, it's very common that they will have overexpressing monocytes and neutrophils, and the myeloid compartment will be out of proportion to the rest of the cells. Right? It's not cancer, it's a precancer. Um, you can also have what's called a monoclonalopathy. Monoclonalopathies mean you have a T cell that is 9 or 10% of all your T cells. And it's a single lineage, it has a single receptor, right? It's a monoclonal opathy, but it's gotten out of hand, right? It's grown like hell, right? And the same thing is true for B cells. Monoclonal opathies are precursors to multiple myelomas. So they may be precursors to various kind of malignancies where the first mutations are occurring in the stem cell because you can see those mutations that make these monoclonal opathies and make the, the myeloid cells in stem cells from people, right? So they occur at pretty low frequencies. In, in a 70 or 80 year old, the frequency can be 0.1 to 
2.003% of the stem cells that I take out and sample, right? Now, I'm relying there on, I want to just be clear about the experimental protocols here. Uh, in order to do that, I'm relying on either taking those stem cells and growing them up as clones and sequencing them, or doing single cell sequencing. And many of you know single cell sequencing accuracy is not gorgeous. You don't get lots of reads without amplifications and so forth. So uh, I'm at the edge of technology now when I tell you that at 0.03% or 0.003% of your stem cells at the age of 70 or 80 have mutations in them, right? The two most common mutations you see, though, when you do this repetitively, are p53. That's pretty interesting because that means the stem cells have, are propagating and not differentiating very well, right? Or another one called TET2. TET2 is an epigenetic modifier. So that's exactly what you would get if you had your lineages abnormal. You know, you make the right amounts of red cells to myeloid cells, and not now you make many more myeloid cells, right? So TET2 would be changing the epigenetic programs, right? And in so doing, so you'd see the phenotype, but at the same time you would allow the, the stem cells to replicate more than before, right? So herein lies the hypothesis. Oh, and this is the why, why I said that, that I'm answering Creston's problem by say, saying, well, there's a randomness to this. Why? Because the mutations have occurred over a lifetime in the stem cell lineages. And some of those mutations give the stem cells an its selective advantage for growth. And the number of stem cells you have at the age of 70 is higher than the number of stem cells you have at the age of 10 because you have accumulated mutations that give the stem cells selective advantages for growth. Stem cells are just like animals. They live in niches all over your body. I told you that they're in the bone marrow. I told you that they're in the hair follicle. They're, they're in the gut, in, but in the crypt of the gut, right? They live in niches where they would replicate if they could. And mutations that, that release that replication allow them to replicate up, right? And, and now we're finding that many tumors have common mutations in them because their stem cells got those mutations, right? The stem cells had a mutation or two which could contribute to these cancers, and then they, but it's not sufficient to give rise to cancer. Right? It may be necessary, but not sufficient. But the lineage of mutations that you can start to put together suggests that some of those mutations occur in stem cells. Right? And the quality of your stem cells is, while its replicative capability is going fine, its quality in producing all the cell types you need for your life in the right ratios is what gets distorted, right? right? So that's a program of differentiation upon which there's a, a, a random mutational selection. And stem cells differ from all other cells in our body, tissue-specific stem cells, in that they, they live forever. And they live forever in the sense that they have telomerase, right? So these stem cells have telomerase. You could see it. They make the telomerase RNA. They make the RNA, right? So, so they're not restricted by Len Hayflick's experiment that we'll hear, right? They're not restricted by that. They would go more than 80, 90 generations, right, so far. Now, you know, th this is like the ever-fulfilling prophecy. You, since this was only discovered four years ago, they've only cultured it for four years and on and on and on, but, but we'll see, right? I can't, I know someone's done counts. And I know th there's a, a, a random mutation rate of the stem cells in culture. And that random mutation rate is about the same as you see in the germline, right? So, so it's low, but it is a random mutation rate. And you can see that by now sequencing the progeny of all of those guys that have common stem cells, right? So that, uh, good, I now have 10 minutes and I could, uh, Happy to answer any questions. I think I've said everything I want to. Yeah. So, the first thing that strikes me is that you said that the column uh, every four days turns over. Uh, yes. But then the skin turns every 28 days. Yes. And then the liver is different as well. Yeah, the liver actually waits for regeneration, right. but it also turns over at a certain rate, right? right? But the mutation rate in all of these compartments is actually the same. Uh, so we will be expecting... Presumably. Right. 
I'll tell you why I don't believe that, but it's a belief, not a fact, right? right? right. Okay. So if you have a, if Can you, you have, my yes, okay, okay, sure. Uh, but I, I'm challenging your uh, I know, assumption. But, but a lot of people assume <laughs> that that's the case, that there is some kind well, of... Well, yes, and I'll challenge that assumption. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, but if, if it was true, wouldn't you expect very different cancer rates in these different organs? Yeah, and you do get very different cancer. You get co that, colon is very, uh, well, it's not necessarily proportional to... I didn't eliminate the environment altogether, right? Your skin is in a different environment than your colon is, right? So uh, that's the first thing that would suggest that mutation rates probably aren't the same, is the environment is very different. What you're exposed to is very different. <coughs> if you smoke and you don't smoke, it's very different, right? So the environment is an important variable. Secondly, if you inherit a DNA repair defect, let's just say mismatch repair defect, right? Uh, the most common cancer is colon. An extremely rare cancer would be pancreatic. A, a never-to-be-seen cancer would, cancer would be prostate, even though prostate's a common cancer, right? So that just means that, that while DNA repair works in every tissue, maybe it doesn't work in exactly the same way because mutations don't have the effect on tissues in equal ways, right? So I, I'm going to actually show you that working, right? So uh, this, this is a, a graph. So this is great because it comes from real statistical data that's wonderful, right? It's not, it's not so wonderful because it's a sad disease, but so there are people who inherit P53 mutations. This is a syndrome called Lee Framini syndrome. It's a, discovered by Lee and Framini, and their families have a tremendous incidence of cancer. Every, it, it, the penetrance of this mutation is 93%. So everybody who get, almost everybody who gets this mutation has a cancer. Some people have as many as seven independent cancers over a lifetime, right? That, that's what tells you how in, important this is, right? So we, we now have um, 2,500 individuals worldwide who have, have carried the P53 mutation gene. Uh, they come from about roughly 270 to 320 families, right? And we've watched them over their lifetimes in, three, in generations. We can see as many as three generations, because not everybody dies of the cancers that they have, right? And we have a very large database of over, in terms of years times people, over 10,000 examples, right? So that large database allows us to ask some questions. And those questions compel us again to come back to the idea that what P53 is surveilling is stem cells. Right? So now let, this is a good example of it. This, these are people with Lee Framini mutations, P53 mutations. This is their age at which they develop a cancer. And this is the type of cancer, right? So you can see already that there are already two groups of cancers that just come up here. In fact, there may be three groups of cancers. There are those that are six months to four, four years or so. And what are they? Adrenal cortical carcinoma, choriplexus papilloma, rhabdomyosarcoma, um, oh, you know, it's not, oh yeah, no. medullary blastomas, right? Those are all your tissues that are replicating like hell when you're a kid. <laughs> this is the medullary blastoma, you're, you're actually putting your brain together for 20 years, right? And in the first five years, this is the tissue that replicates the most. And that's the only time you get mutations it, it, for P53 to surveil. You don't see medullary blastomas after that, right? And then the same thing is true with breast cancer. It's in only females in this case get breast cancer, and it's in the years in which the breast develops and expands and contracts and expands and contracts and goes away, right? And then the statistic that really blows my mind is that remember I said 93% penetrance, that means 7% of people who have the mutation have never had cancer all their lives, right? They're 70, 80 years old. In fact, there are two, there's a couple that's 100 years old. This couple's in Brazil. They're, they're both 100 years old, they both have the P53 mutation and neither of them have ever gotten cancer, right? right. So, they're, and they're in very good shape, right? Their frequency above the age of 60, their chance their chance, the risk of getting cancer is lower than the general population in that group. So if we take that 7% group, 
right? And look for the incidence of cancer in that 7% group over the age of 70, and then look at the general population. That's the time the general population is going up, and they've stopped completely. Now, I think they have stem cells, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be alive. But I think there's something very different about their stem cells that has really protected them against, against the ravages of this, this time. So there, there's a lot of this evidence that's starting to pour in that likes the idea that stem cell surveillance has to do with cancer, has to do with longevity, has to do with some things. That's the hypothesis. Yes. I'll, I'll go around the room. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I, I do have a question, but I don't like to think that's both. But the, the first one is Suppose we give you one. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Take the most one. important. Oh, yes, the second one. <laughs> so when you say in, in, uh, that there's mutations and in some sense Darwinian selection for growth of stem cells, that it, you know, that's very different than a, than, a, than, a, than a approach which would say there's a breakdown in DNA repair machinery or there's chromatin damage or something which is allowing more mutations that's not really a selection problem. It's not, it's not exclusive of that. Right. I, I believe in breakdowns so, in DNA repair. I so, believe in chromatin right. abnormalities. So, so. Is how we, what, is the, what ways do we have to decide? It, is, it, is it really just mutations? Or like hang on, hang on, hang on. If, if you're a BRCA1, right? If, oh, if, sorry. if you're a BRCA1, so let me just answer your question. If you're a BRCA1, right? You have a DNA repair defect. You have a homologous DNA repair defect, yeah. right? You'll never get a breast tumor that isn't p53 mutant, right? Why? Because it's surveilling DNA damage. <laughs> it kills the cell that has the DNA damage, right? So you need both, right? So I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive. I'm saying they actually work together in a very similar pathway. And I've said that the most common mutation in stem cells is not BRCA1. It's actually, we don't see BRCA1, is actually p53. That's all I've said. But I wouldn't eliminate anything you said about DNA damage or anything else. I think it's important. Yes? So I, I couldn't, um, I mean, you said that P53 mutations accumulate uh, with time. But, but is, it, is it the case that all these mutations are deleterious? Or only some subset? I think it's a subset that are deleterious. That so I, I, I can tell you we. I, one of the wonderful things about working at Princeton University is you have four or five undergraduates in the lab every year, and they're really capable kids, right? But they don't have to publish papers. So what we did was we looked at all of the mutations that occur in a particular region of P53 called the DNA binding domain where mutations occur, right? And there were seven or eight amino acids that never mutated, right? And we made those mutations, and they had no effect on function, right? So there are places where mutations occur that have no effect on function. So, so in, in, with that in mind, this 0.003% to yeah. the extent one can believe that number. Um, to uh, the extent, yes. Uh, uh, um, it's a fair, fair uh, argument. Uh, 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 maybe maybe uh, they're all reasonable and not that different. Oh, they, they've all been tested. I'm, we have a database that says this mutation has occurred, you know, 100,000 times in human beings and it causes cancer, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's not an issue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, do I have my... Yes, the mic. Essential. This volume. is essential. <laughs> no, no, no. Oop. Yeah. I'm about so, to be killed. Look, it, it, it makes perfect sense that the, the cells that are, let's say stem cells that are multiply uh, dividing to, to provide replacement epithelia and your, and your blood and so forth would accumulate uh, uh, mutations uh, and they would do it preferentially because that's where the division is happening and also that uh, the regulatory uh, the killing mechanism for mistakes is turned off and yeah. so that would help them accumulate error. Okay. Now, uh, uh, it, it reactivates at the time of differentiation. Understood. Yeah. Now, so Let's let's take that as a working hypothesis that this is kind of a design problem of the of the of the. It's a mutually exclusive issue. Yeah. Now <laughs> you so can't you can't replicate in the presence of the death you know gene. All right. So <laughs> now we come to the question of different lifetimes for different animals. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you're talking something really fundamental like mistakes, okay, uh, are you uh, proposing that? 
animals have different lifetimes because they have different rates of mutation accumulation? I never said that. Or they have, or they have different uh, machinery in them. Of Multiple catching. choice question. <laughs> Not a. Go well, ahead. What is, what, how do you want to account for different lifetimes of animals? That's that's it. I, I, I don't want to account for it right now. <laughs> I, I, I I couldn't begin to tell you why a dog, little dogs. <laughs> die at one age and big dogs die at an earlier age and that those ages are very different than us. I don't know the answer to it. I, I know all of the problems in trying to answer it. Metabolic rate, the mutation rates, uh, cell division rates, stem cell rates, all this stuff. I know all of the problems. I just don't have any answers for it. Well, I'm the sorry. Point, the point is that that fact in yes. nature tells you that this particular thing you've put your finger on is not what is determining the lifetime of the animal. Why is that? Well, because it's the same in all of them. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't say that either. I, I, I don't, well, how many stem cells does a dog have? And what is its rate of division? And how many divisions does it go through? Look, and why do have little dogs ways. have a different thing? Either the machinery, dog? either this you particular mechanism is different, different in different animals, you don't? or it's the same in different animals. Which is it? I don't know. Do you? Well, it, would, it would be um, different capacities to repair mutations that are arising. Right, so, so the, you know, the underlying mistakes are being made. Why is this hard to answer experimentally? You just measure it. Well, why don't you do it? Why no, don't you do it? I mean, you're the one that asked the question. I didn't ask the question. Look, you're the guy with the theory. I'm asking a good question about your theory. I think your theory's I'm wrong because it doesn't make sure, any sense. I'm not sure it's a good question. <laughs> it's a great question. <laughs> I just think you've t chosen something we don't know the answer to and therefore said there can be no theories, right? Because there are a lot of things we don't know the answer to. And it is a good question to measure it. I just don't have the capacity in my lab to do stem cells in dogs and stem cells in planarians, stem cells, right? But I'm sure the mutation rates, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what the mutation rates are in dogs. Yes? What do we do about the situation with somatic cells in C. elegans, all right, mutilic, they don't replicate? Yeah. Damage yeah. them, they don't yeah. replace. Yeah. And you see so the same prospect the, of aging yeah. in the beast yeah. as we do in everybody else. So uh, C. elegans and Drosophila both are born post mitotic. Uh, but born is a funny term here because that's after the larval stages, which are mitotic, right? Uh, and there's one tissue that is retaining mitotic, uh, uh, and that is the, the totipotent stem cell, yeah. uh, two of them actually, they're, they're also actually immune cells <laughs> actually that replicate. And, so, and some people say gut cells replicate in, in Drosophila, but nonetheless, there are a few tissues that, re that may replicate, but this guy resides in the germline, where the replication is, right? So uh, that, that's what I think is happening there. It is enforcing fidelity in the germline just as it's enforcing fidelity in our somatic stem cells is what I would conclude, right? So then, then lifespan in the various species <coughs> of nematodes, is that no, um, well, measurable by the levels of So I'm, I'm not sure I know how to do, uh, to get at the question you're, I think, asking. If something is born post-mitotic, so it's not gonna divide again, it is a very different player than uh, the mammals, or all the vertebrates, who are re regenerating their tissues at all times, right? All right, but if... So I'm, I'm, it, may be, it may be that there's some relationship, but I don't see it very clearly. But since you can modulate the lifespan, the mean longevity of C. elegans, yes. right? by just the environment in which you place or, those Or a single mutation in a gene. Well, no, if I do a whole population azenically, and yeah. I do a whole population monozenically, oh, yeah. all right, Yes. I will alter the mean longevity yes, of because, both cases. Well, that's because these guys actually die of infectious diseases. They, they, in fact, if you ask the C. elegans people in, in the why they're dying, they say E. coli has outgrown them and it's no longer in the intestine, it's in the, right? Which is and that's by two and a half weeks. For monozenic, but I grew, most of my studies are done azenic, that's not the problem. There's nobody else there except that. No, I, I understand that, okay. but didn't you say they live longer? The azenics, I can get to the end points 
that are have biological markers. I cannot do that with yes. those that are going so to it, it could be because of the fact yeah, the other I have no, no argument with you. I, uh, yeah. It could well be that other, all the people in the field are doing their experiments the wrong way because they're dying of infectious diseases, but you have That's gotten to the point where pure biology plays, right? Maybe. So now, I the only reason to do it is any because you only want to look yeah. at that organism yeah. and the things that it produces yeah. in the environment yeah. relative to time yeah. and the destruction. Yeah, but there, the there are no regenerating tissues in that. Correct. Yeah. Which is what I, why I like to model for yeah. looking at things that yeah. drive yeah. senescence. So it's an irrelevancy from my model for humans, right? It, Correct. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't. Well, I don't argue with you cancer about. because that's a different story. Yeah, well, they don't get cancer. That's, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Do you have any experience or insight into what happens to parabiotic young and old animals? <laughs> uh, I, I don't in this area. In, in the in the area, what I'm talking about is the tissue-specific stem cell area, and I don't know whether or not they'll readjust the lifetimes. So, so it's possible with mice to have mice that die at 200 days and mice that die at 600 days, right? I mean, and that's, that's an inherited and genetically. I, I like mice because they're closer to the stem cell issue, right? And, and parabiosis would be one experiment you could do with that. Um, could you define that for some Oh, parabiosis is where you take the circulatory system of two different organisms and you connect them up. Oh. So that all of the soluble components in the guy that lives 600 <coughs> days now course through the guy who lives 200 days and you ask what's dominant physiologically. It's a physiological dominance. Yeah. Young and old. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, young and old. There's been lots of experiments done where you put young tumors in old mice or old tumors in young mice and there are very lot of differences in, Mostly you come to the conclusion that vascularization is a big issue. That the old mice just have slow tumors and they don't, even young tumors, they don't grow very well in old mice. And that's because of the vascularization issue. That vascularization coming from the mouse, so the age of the mouse is the variable for vascularization. Yes? So can you comment on the, the, the cancer incidence rates in regenerating animals versus non regenerating animals? Uh, you would expect them, I guess it is, it's not obvious that it should be that way, but you know, I, I would have a hunch that regenerating animals should get more cancer. Yeah, so I, to the best of my knowledge, people who cut off legs of amphibians uh, have not looked at the incidence of cancer in the leg afterwards or anything like that. But yeah, if you kept it up and you kept stressing, this is back to the question of whether the stem cell division is the important variable or what. Mm -hmm. um, it, it could be that you'll have enough divisions to have enough mutations. Remember the mutation, if the mutation rate is 60 per division, right, let's say that's an estimated mutation rate, uh, most of those, in fact, literally the prob probability of where those mutations will be is in 98% of the DNA that has no coding effects and, and, or very little phenotype or anything like that. So, so can I cut my finger off? And, uh, and let's say I had a magical... The answer uh, to that question is yes, you can. <laughs> yes. Now and what's going to happen next, and, right? And yes. let's say uh, I had a magical means of shutting yes. off P53. Uh, oh, yeah. I, that, uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you a bill in the morning, but I wouldn't recommend it, no. <laughs> Would I get something similar to the planaria uh, response? And, uh, you know, no, planaria has P53. It just knows how to turn it on and off. I, um, so and so where I, to turn it off. I, I don't, you're pushing me to an extension of what I've said again. I, I'm trying to be yeah. very careful about, uh -huh. most of the questions I'm getting are sort of these extensions of where the corollaries to what I've said are going, right? I, I, that's a fair way to do science, it is. And, and so your question, I think, is a fair question. Um, I, I just think it's a complex question. Um, that not so simply answered by shutting off P53 and asking does you, do you, does your regeneration go faster or not? Things like that. So let me 